Well, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be with you this afternoon to speak about uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin um, and the lung. What I hope to do over the next uh, little while, and Dr. Chapman did say go as long as I want, he'll squash his talk as needed. Thank you, Ken. Is to uh, help everyone be familiar, and many of you uh, know more than I do about this, but in regards to the general assessment and the management of alpha-1 deficiency and the lung, and we're going to focus on, on the lung uh, for this purpose, We'll also address, as uh, Angela did mention from the guidelines, the populations appropriate for targeted testing of alpha-1 levels, and then the role of alpha-1 antitrypsin augmentation therapy as laid out by the guidelines and some subsequent guidelines that have been produced. You will be hearing more up-to-date research as well as specifics about uh, augmentation therapy by others. But I also want to um, emphasize, to appreciate the many pharmacologic, non-pharmacologic medications and intervention strategies that we have that are very, very important for people who suffer from COPD, including those with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. Uh, this is my conflict of interest disclosure. I do have relations with uh, industry, uh, professional societies, government, uh, healthcare systems. Uh, my research funding is all managed by the University of Saskatchewan, and I am a, uh, a professor, associate vice president of research at the University of Saskatchewan. So alpha-1 antitrypsin, it is a plasma antiprotease that functions in part to inhibit neutrophil elastase. And the normal phenotype, the PIM, um, is, is MM, you usually have, but there is a, a a deficiency phenotype PIZ, which would be the most common. There are others, PIS, for instance, but it tends to have milder implications impact than the uh, PIZ. The deficiency occurs as a result of inheritance of two uh, deficiency alleles or a null allele, which is held on chromosome 14, the most common being PIZZ about 90% of the time. But there are others, PISZ and, and some other variations on the theme. That protease in protease imbalance that subsequently occurs because of that deficient allele results in inoppo or unopposed activity of the elastases and consequent unopposed degradation and destruction of lung tissue. And this happens very slowly. It happens unrelentingly over time. This is data that is uh, from a prior guideline in 2003 by the American Thoracic Society and European Respiratory Society that shows the various levels with normal MM, PIMM, and then various heterozygote, homozygote, and then down to ZZ. And I uh, pressed that by mistake. Um, we typically use a level of lower than 11 micromoles per liter, and there are different uh, values and standards that are doing. So we're going to use, uh, just to, to make it easy, I'm going to report everything in micromoles per liter. Now, this is not absolute. There are variations on the theme, but in general, this holds true. You can see that, for instance, some individuals with SZ may have levels that are lower and may subsequently be affected. But it kind of frames our discussion and takes it forward in terms of who um, might be targets for therapy and various interventions. So we know that people who have significantly reduced levels, are, uh, it leads to and it is associated with emphysema and COPD, first described in 1963, and we've learned quite a bit. We know that if there are other environmental harms to the lung, be it uh, air, be it cigarette smoking, tobacco, and so forth, that that can be accelerated. We know that heterozygotes, so that would not be the ZZ, it might be the MZ or variations, who only have one deficiency allele, will have reduced levels, but are not thought to be considered in general to have significant COPD. But they may have reduced lung function, and practically speaking, we tend to use a level, a plasma level, of less than or equal to 11 as kind of our, our threshold, but it's not a light switch, it's a continuum. And so there has to be some thoughtfulness, some thinking about that. We know that the severe deficiency occurs in different um, um, incidents in various populations, about 1 in 1,600 in the Scandinavian population, and about 1 in 5,000, 5,500 in the North American population. And the deficiency in general is about 1 to 5%, and that's a big spread when you look at how many people have COPD, and that is an underestimate. We know that not everybody with alpha-1 antitrypsin knows they either carry the gene or may be affected by it, and that's just a fact. So what does this mean? 
thought I'd show a chest x-ray. The one normal is a, is a chest x-ray. This is a female. You can see the heart in the middle and the lungs. The one who has alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you can see that the volumes are increased. And ordinarily, that would be a good thing, but these volumes are increased because of trapped gas, gas that can't participate in breathing. Secondly, things look a lot blacker, darker, because of destruction of the lung tissue and the pulmonary vasculature. And so that air and blood relationship interface is affected. So there's a whole bunch of reasons why people who have alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency are short of breath, can't walk, can't do certain activities and such. So in 2012, on behalf of the Canadian Thoracic Society, uh, myself and a number of colleagues did put together um, some clinical practice guidelines. And the background for that is that the Canadian Thoracic Society had put together a position statement in 2001 and a prior one in 1992. Despite that, and there had been advances, there had been some understanding, things like endpoints such as CT scan density and so forth, but there was a lack of consensus, lack of understanding, not only amongst patients, but also my colleagues, physicians, specialists in the healthcare system, who would be appropriate patients suitable for testing, who should get tested for alpha-1 and what type of testing, and secondly, who would be appropriate for augmentation therapy? Does it help? What is the best uh, type of patient uh, population? So the purpose was to provide a respected and practical guideline using very um, disciplined, state-of-the-art techniques for putting together a guideline to speak to those two issues. So I'll just summarize for you kind of what the results of that whole process were. The first question we asked is what population would be most appropriate for the testing in order to provide, improve, or lead to improved case finding of patients. And the recommendation, and you can see that at the bottom is a grade of the recommendation. And there's very strict criteria for whether a recommendation is one or two and A or B or C, based on the various evidence. So a, a one recommendation is stronger, and a two A would be stronger than a two C, for instance. And it wouldn't be a recommendation based on what Dr. Chapman thinks or Darcy thinks. It would be based on criteria from the published literature. So your hands are kind of tied. It also is a point to illustrate that there may be lack of evidence, and lack of evidence doesn't necessarily mean lack of benefit. And so it, it, it gets a bit complicated. But we did conclude, and we said we suggest, and we're mandated again to use the word suggest versus recommend because it's grade two versus grade one. So just so that, uh, just trying to help you understand. We suggest targeted testing for deficiency be considered in individuals with COPD, so diagnosed COPD, before the age of 65 with a smoking history of less than 20 pack years. So that was a abbreviation, a constellation of all the research findings. We then spoke to, is therapy effective in COPD in patients with documented deficiency? And it's wordy, but we did say that yes, it would be because of improvements in CT scan lung density, that was a grade 2B, so that was a bit stronger, and then also because of mortality, a grade 2C. So we concluded that it would be appropriate in non-smoking or ex-smoking, so not current smokers, who have COPD, and we provided a range, which went up to kind of mild COPD because of the potential to prevent further problems, attributable to a deficiency, a level less than 11, less than or equal to 11, who are receiving optimal medications and non-pharmacologic interventions because of benefits as, as I've laid out. And then we further put all those findings into a table. So you can see the endpoints, and then you can see the results. So there was evidence of benefit in reducing exacerbations. Uh, sorry, evidence of no benefit in reducing exacerbations or quality of life. Those are grade B studies up top here. But there was evidence of benefit for lung function and for improvements in CT scan lung density. Many other endpoints, dyspnea, shortness of breath, activity or exercise and healthcare utilization really were not studied. And what became very clear is that there was a paucity of data, in part because it's a difficult field. How do you demonstrate or assess or follow the benefit of an intervention that may be given today or over a week, over a year, when it takes 10, 20, 30 years for something to happen? It's just tough to do studies like that. Secondly, the population is not as large as others. And so there's these realities 
that make interpretation difficult. Nonetheless, we did recommend testing and then, inter and then um, augmentation therapy in those settings. Now that was 2012. Since then, others have addressed and looked at this. These are the Spanish guidelines. And in our world, the Spaniards are pretty good. In the respiratory world, it's kind of the Spaniards, the Canadians, and we have to include some of the Americans as well. But those would be kind of the people who lead our field. And in 2015, and you probably can't see this, but they essentially uh, uh, agreed to what we had had in the Canadians. That, um, uh, with a few differences, they recommended that alpha-1 levels should be measured in all individuals with COPD. So they put it out to all. In a, in a two, they did not recommend routine determination in people with bronchiectasis, although they said it could be done by case by case. They did not recommend in asthmatic patients. And then they did recommend replacement therapy, very similar to what we did. In fact, they used almost identical language, although they didn't have a lower, but they said less than 80% who are optimized and such. So that's three years later, the Spaniards. In 2016, the Cochrane Review. So the Cochrane body is, a, is an entity that kind of does uh, systematic reviews, condensing uh, um, findings, trying to take many, many small studies and put them together and see can we learn when, when we do this. And they're fairly good at what they do, but they have some limitations. This, I think, is one of their weakest efforts. So in 2016, they updated this area. And they basically said, and I've highlighted this, that the opinion was that augmentation therapy with alpha-1 antitrypsin cannot be recommended. They specifically did not look at CT scan lung density. They only looked at some of the areas that we had previously said, in fact, there's no data. So this was their conclusion. And I do want to highlight the, the, the bottom um, bullet. And I'm not trying to pick on Ken, um, although he's in the room, and I would say this even if he wasn't. But they, just to give you an idea of the atmosphere and the mood, they said, and I'm quoting, the most recent trial, this is the one Dr. Chapman um, was the lead author, was industry supported, and the academic authors had numerous financial conflicts of interest. So the sponsor collected the data. Three employees of the company participated in the analysis and writing. So I, I, I think this is not Dr. Chapman's fault. I think what happened here is, and this happens uh, many times in our field, in our industry, people sometimes are looking for reasons to say no, and they're often, um, quite aside from the protection, the, the um, um, barriers that we have, the conflict of interest, and the, the, the ways that we can isolate funding from results and so forth that are very strict, very public, very transparent, uh, this is sometimes how things are interpreted, and it leads to, I think, coloring and flavoring of some of their conclusions. Uh, the ERS, on the other hand, European Respiratory Society in 2017 concluded similar, and they also looked at some other issues. So they said, for instance, that uh, CT scan uh, densitometry was a valid endpoint. They said that there was no evidence to support in homozygotes or or heterozygotes, so the SZ in particular, or the MZ, or current smokers. They said that, in fact, lung densitometry is the most sensitive, given all that occurs, and in fact, there are some correlations with FEV1 and with health status. So you're starting to see a little bit deeper, a little bit broader field and understanding uh, in this area. And then finally, CADET, so the Canadian Agency for Drugs, Technology, and Health put out a review in 2017. And they're usually asked to do a review by um, a government agency or something like that here in Canada. And they typically tend to, to do a good job. Sometimes they do instill a bit of opinion, um, and I'll show you some of that. So they, they summarize that the uh, CT scan lung density was significantly less compared to placebo that the rate of FEV1 decline was not a consistent signal. There were contradictory findings, and that was similar to what the Canadians and others had suggested. That there was also contradictory, not a consistent signal for exacerbations. And the reason they highlight that is in COPD, just in general COPD, the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, Health Canada, and I was just meeting with Health Canada yesterday, their two primary endpoints in COPD are FEV1 and exacerbation. So that's why they, they highlight that. But it's become apparent in this entity that those are not very sensitive. So they did mention that CT scan lung density can be uh, something that is used. And they provided some tables. So they reviewed some guidelines from the COPD Foundation. And on the left side, 
why the guideline is good on the right side, why the guideline is not so good. So you can see here there's about a balance on, on both sides. They seem to like the Canadian guideline. So this is the one from 2012. And in fact, some of the ones that they put here on the right side are, um, I would argue, maybe because this is, I led this effort, uh, maybe not as, as, as valid and easy to remedy, but nonetheless, they did highlight a lot of the, the benefits uh, for this. And I think in their opinion, in their words that they described were uh, supportive of what we had concluded um, in the past. So I wanted to provide just a little bit of a background of where we were and some of the updates from, from guidelines. I'll leave the most recent literature and, and kind of how it plays, as well as specifics in augmentation therapy to the next presentations. But I also want to emphasize that sometimes we concentrate on some things and it may not be the most important or the only important. You, you've probably seen this, it says, caution, the sign has sharp edges, do not touch the edges of the sign. And at the very bottom it says, also the bridge is out. So we are always, and we should be, focused on access, removing barriers and so forth, replacement therapy. Why is one province like this and the other is like this? This is bad, but we need to also remember that there are many other effective things, interventions we can do. This is from 1965, blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. I mean, it's just so romantic. It's just dreamy. Try that nowadays. <laughs> I mean, you'll get more than arrested. Um, it's just a different time and a different place. And, and many of you um, were raised at a time when smoking was socially acceptable. My parents used to give me 65 cents in exact change to go to the ShopRite store to pick up uh, Rothman's King Size. And then I would, I would come back. I was the... the the Amazon or the courier for their cigarettes. It was just life, that's just the way it was. Times are different now. But we still have millions and millions and millions of Canadians who smoke. And we're getting bombarded with new ways of being exposed to the harms of tobacco and other sort of entities like that. So, so this is very important. So I wanted to just highlight that in the Canadian Thoracic Society recommendations, that it's important that every patient receive, you are entitled to realize the benefits of our puffers, our oral therapies, our non-pharmacologic therapies, and you cannot because access to some of this is impaired. There are not pulmonary rehab programs across the country that everybody can participate. So it's also important that we work and concentrate and deliver this effectively so that patients can benefit. So we do have ways of guiding this. This is the most recent Canadian Thoracic Society comprehensive management for COPD. So this is what we share to primary care providers, to, to, to family physicians, nurse practitioners, to specialists, to other internists and respirologists that look at the assessment of COPD, ensuring that individuals have, at the very baseline, for the very mildest disease, should have integrated care, which addresses smoking cessation, vaccination, activity, exercise, and so forth and then various therapies, which includes for moderate, severe, and very severe pulmonary rehabilitation. And we know that when we can combine effective inhaled therapies with pulmonary rehabilitation, one plus one equals three. This is data, and my math is correct. This is data from um, 2005 that was published in CHEST. These are individuals who have COPD that is pretty bad. They're mean FEV1, forced expired volume in one second. So when you take a big breath in and blow it hard and fast and keep on blowing until you're right empty, you're empty, keep on blowing, keep on. The first second is the FEV1. So this is 34% of predicted. So this is significant, severe COPD. So these individuals were walking on a treadmill about nine or 10 minutes. Then they were offered a continuation of either their short acting bronchodilator or a long acting bronchodilator in blue. And in this case, it was teotropium, spireva, a type of what we call a long acting muscarinic antagonist, once a day administration. After four weeks, they were then enrolled in a pulmonary rehabilitation program. A pretty good, a pretty effective pulmonary rehabilitation program, targeted, goal oriented pulmonary rehabilitation. And there's a few findings. First of all, look what pulmonary rehabilitation does to how far or how long someone can walk. Big difference. Second, 
Look at the impact of better, long-acting, more effective bronchodilator therapy compared to the short-acting. Quite a difference in all the way. And the third, maybe the most important learning here, we used to think, we used to believe the COPD was irreversible. But if I can have patients who go from nine or 10 minutes to 22 or 23 minutes with pulmonary rehabilitation and a single effect of bronchodilator therapy, isn't that make that, that irreversible a lie? Everybody would want to do this and everybody should do this. It's very, very effective. We also know that it's important to adhere to the medication. This is data from a study that was published in 2005, the original study. They did some analysis afterwards, and there's some limitations to the analysis. But what they found is very interesting. In individuals who took more than 80% of the prescribed medication, after three years, the mortality was about 11.3%. So about 11, and this was significant COPD, so about 11% died. If they took less than 80%, their mortality was about 26%. Now again, this is observational, so it's not a pure cause and effect, but it is interesting, and it does have a physiologic, a biologic plausibility for this in terms of the benefits of medication. And we now have medications for COPD that have been shown to demonstrate a mortality benefit. They save lives. But boy, is it confusing. Lots and lots of medications. So there's two ways to look at this. Boy, it's confusing. That's the first one. Or the other one is, isn't this great? Because now we have choice. We have many other options. Because we used to have not so many options of medications that didn't work all that well, and people would be taking two puffs four times a day of three different medications. Just think of the time that was spent. And now you can get once a day or twice a day administration combinations that are much, much, much more effective. So while this is confusing, this is also pretty good. Our job, our task is to make this less confusing. So take that gray and all these options and try and make them understandable. And there are ways to do it. So for instance, there are learning techniques and, and schools and and videos and YouTube and all this sort of stuff to try and help with the various uh, devices that we have. Because we not only have to be interested in the medication, the specific formulation, but also the device. Is it done properly? Are you able to do that? And so there's help in that regard. So rest trek is, is one of them. Live well with COPD is another. There's lots and lots of ways that we can help. And the lung associations across the country are a big partner, a big asset in sort of helping with this. That's why we have certified respiratory educators now to try and manage this problem. Because if you're not aware and you're just giving a puffer, it's confusing. It's not fair, it's confusing. So we have to help with that. It's more than just a pill. And then there's means to try and tie all this together. This is our program that we offer in Saskatchewan, the Live Well Chronic Disease Management Program, COPD Chronic Disease Management Program. Not all of our patients are this happy, <laughs> but she certainly is. That's why she's on the cover. <laughs> and it's built on three pillars, increasing, improving activity, and pulmonary rehabilitation. In a social setting, so people can make friends, they can learn how to dance, they can have birthday parties and things like that, at the same time as they're doing more, at the same time as their fitness levels are coming, and the deconditioning is becoming reversed. And it's very, very effective. The second pillar is regarding self-management. And there's different ways to do it. We use Kate Lorig's program, Live Well with Chronic Conditions, that has been demonstrated to be effective. It's patient-led, so there's not me sitting at the front telling people what to do. And it's been proven to improve self-efficacy, self-management, so that people are better partners in managing, understanding their condition. And we love patients who are activated. We love patients who are engaged and informed. Because again, that's just a, a, a perfect combination. And then finally, in the middle, this is an interprofessional team, the right person doing the right job, working together around the patient and their family and the primary care provider, be it a, a family physician or nurse provider. So we don't take patients, we don't steal them, we add to that mix using evidence-based, evidence-informed care. So things that don't work, we don't do. And that takes discipline, because sometimes we hope, we believe, we think, 
but, but we have to stay focused because we don't have resources for everything. So we use things that, have, that work. And what does it achieve? Quite a bit. So this is data that was published in 2009 in our annual report to the government. So people, and this is a one-year program that has a three-year legacy. So after one year, people can choose to participate, volunteer. So they're able to walk farther, 64 meters in the six-minute walk test. So that's a test that we use for activity. And anything over 30-meter improvement, the patient notices. And 64 meters is a lot. So that's good. Quality of life, we use something called the St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire. So lower is better. So if you're normal, you're a university student and it's Friday night and you're going to the bar, you've got an SGRQ of five. If you're suffering from bad chronic disease, you've just been in hospital, things are not good, you're maybe 70. So there's different sort of variations. I'm probably 25, um, I'm gonna pick on Ken again, he's probably six, just happy as hell. <laughs> so we're able to take that down quite a bit. A significant difference of four units means quite a bit. So going down by eight or 5.6 or 5.3 is significant. So they can walk farther and they have a better quality of life. And then we've been able to do that while reducing the time that people spend in hospital. So readmission rates went down by 71%, hospital days by 62%, emergency room visits by 40%. And then at three years, those signals were still there. And when you do the cost uh, effectiveness or cost avoidance, there's a dollar 71 avoided for every dollar invested in the program, direct cost, not even indirect, just direct cost. So you can, by doing all these things, improve the quality of life. You can enhance how far people can walk. You can reduce flare-ups. You can decrease the time people spend in hospital, and you can save money. So that's in, in healthcare improvement, quality assurance, that's a triple aim that's what's been discussed, and it's, and it's very, very achievable. So I'll close, and I'd be happy to take any questions if there's time or if there's not. Uh, we can do it later. I'll be around for the next few hours. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency has significant consequences, and there are significant gaps, significant barriers, both in the diagnosis and its management, optimal management. Targeted testing, and I'm just relaying what we said in the Canadian Thoracic Society guidelines, should be offered and performed in individuals with COPD diagnosed before 65 years of age, and the Spaniards would say all ages, with a smoking history that is not very significant. Augmentation therapy, again, should be available so that patients can make a choice, together with their physicians, whether it is appropriate based on these guidelines. But also importantly, it has to be coupled, partnered with effective pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies for patients suffering from COPD, including those suffering from COPD with alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So thank you very much, and I'm gonna to apologize to Ken Chapman. <laughs>